What's up my friend, Abby here, and welcome back to Writer's Life Wednesdays, where we come together to help you make your story matter and make your author dreams come true. A couple weeks ago, we talked about line editing and I showed you a little behind the scenes look at my line editing process. And in that video, I mentioned cutting weak words out of my writing, but I didn't actually go into what those weak words are because that's a whole video in and of itself. And so that's what we're doing today. We're going to explore the 10 weakest and most pathetic words that you should probably delete from your novel. And I say probably because it's not always appropriate to delete a weak word. Yes, you heard me right. Sometimes weak words actually work. Which is why in this video, we are going to go through these words and as we go through them, I'm going to show you examples from my own writing of when you should cut them and when you should keep them. Why does your story matter? Good question. What if I told you that there's a science behind every great story? I don't just teach you how to write. I teach you how to change the world with your story and make your author dreams come true. A couple of years ago, I went on this huge editing research spree and found a bunch of weak words, collected them from articles and videos and blog posts and just all over the internet. All the weak words that you should look for in your novel, compiled them into a giant list in my notebook and then sifted through to figure out which ones are actually worth spending my time on. And now every time I sit down to edit a novel, I'm on high alert for these 10 words ready to chop them, <laughs> but not always. There is a time and place to keep them. And that's what we're gonna talk about right now. Please note, when I cut these words, I totally disregard all the times that they appear in dialogue. I love realistic character voice and people in real life do not always use perfect strong words when they speak. So if there's a weak word in dialogue, I don't care about it. I usually intentionally put it there because I love realistic character voice and most people don't talk like a college syllabus in real life, okay? So this video is to help you strengthen your prose and your descriptions and anything that isn't dialogue. But you still have to take character voice into account here, even with the narration. So keep in mind how your character speaks and thinks and let's dive into the weak words. First up, suddenly. Use this word sparingly, okay? My rule of thumb is only use suddenly when something is actually sudden, because technically everything happens suddenly, but you're trying to make your reader sit up and take notice of this thing specifically. So it kind of makes sense that if you use this word too much, you lose your element of surprise, okay? It's like the boy who cried wolf. Suddenly, we don't care about anything happening suddenly because everything happens suddenly. <laughs> Kudos if you just noticed my unnecessary use of the word suddenly. Here's an example of where I could cut this word from my own writing. I turn away suddenly, heading for my bike. A few kids ask me where I'm going, but I pretend I can't hear them over the music. If suddenly was removed from the sentence, it would literally change nothing. <laughs> I turn away, heading for my bike. A few kids ask me where I'm going, but I pretend I can't hear them over the music. In this scene, my character is annoyed, so we already know that he's turning away suddenly without having to say suddenly. Now, when should we keep suddenly? When something sudden happens. Like in this scene from the same book, when a fight breaks out and my character finds himself caught in the middle of it. Everything erupts into chaos, shouts and cusses. My adrenaline spikes and suddenly every muscle in my body is on fire. Yes, I will probably strengthen that sentence even more, but I'm gonna leave suddenly alone. So here's the verdict. Cut it when the action happens just as suddenly without you needing to say suddenly. Keep it when something is sudden enough to throw off your character and thus throw off your reader. Weak word number two, then. The problem with then is simple, it's filler. We know that one thing happens then another thing happens. Of course, this is how cause and effect works. We learned Newtonian physics in first grade, thank you very much. Technically, you could preface 
every single sentence in your book with the word then. There's something to keep you up at night. Here's an example of where I could cut then from my own writing. He stares at me, blinking as if I'm a ghost. Then he pulls off his headphones, letting them drop around his neck. Look at that then. There's literally no reason for it to be there. He stares at me, blinking as if I'm a ghost. He pulls off his headphones, letting them drop around his neck. See how marginally better that is? The sentence flows exactly the same, but without interruptions. When is it perfectly fine to use the word then? when something actually changes. Then is a lot like the word but, in that it's a bridge between two actions to show how those actions are different. For example, trees and sunlight blur around me, then give way to a clearing. Here I'm describing the scenery changing, so it works just fine. In fact, if I deleted the word then from this sentence, it would sound weird. So that's a good rule of thumb. <laughs> Cut it if the sentence flows normally when it's gone, Keep it if it's bridging the gap between two actions and highlighting the difference. Weak word number three is very and or really. We all know this rule. Don't say you're very tired, say you're exhausted. This is a great rule to write by because tagging very or really onto the beginning of a weak descriptor doesn't make it any stronger. <laughs> Here's an example of where I could cut very from my own writing. After that, she curls my hair for me. It's actually really cute, soft beach waves that touch my shoulders. Well, I can think of a synonym for very cute. After that, she curls my hair for me. It's actually adorable, soft beach waves that touch my shoulders. Better. And here's an example of where really works just fine. I try to find a way to thank him without really thanking him at all. So be careful with this one and just trust your instincts. Cut it when you could use a stronger word. Keep it in cases of the very next day, the very front, the very back, the very edge, really there, really happening, really consider, etc. And everywhere it sounds better with really very than without. Weak word number four is and was. Technically, this is passive voice, telling and not showing. Whenever you're telling me that something is or was, there's no action attached to it. The sky was blue or the sun is shining feels flat because it is flat. It's stagnant and boring. Here's an example. She was small and curvy, wearing a lacy dress and holding a hairbrush in one hand. The soft light was reflecting in her eyes and making her milk pale skin seem to glow. Here's the cool part. If I take out was, I'm basically forced to give the sentence more action. Like this. A lacy white dress hugged her small curvy figure and she held a hairbrush in one hand. Her milk pale skin glowed in the soft light and her eyes reflected in it. Yes, you can describe inactive things like dresses and skin with active words. But believe it or not, there are actually some instances where it's better to tell rather than show. When you need to deliver information quickly and seamlessly to the reader without slowing down the action of the scene. Like this. The closest mall is 50 miles away, so it's never a frequent outing. It would be kind of ridiculous to spend time making that an active sentence, like the closest mall sits in a town 50 miles away. It would just sound like it's too many, too many words to describe something so simple and slow down the action of the scene. So sometimes telling is actually okay. Cut it when you can show us what the subject is doing instead of what the subject simply is. Keep it when the subject is inactive and you need to convey the information quickly. Weak word number five, started. Don't start to do something, okay? Just do it. There are very few instances where the words start to are actually necessary. Here's an example. Despite the murmur of the party guests and the muted chorus of an old Christmas album that has started playing, the room is quiet to my ears. That sentence isn't bad, but it's a little muddy. Despite the murmur of the party guests and the muted chorus of an old Christmas album playing in the background, the room is quiet to my ears. Much better. So when can we say something started? When something actually started, especially when a character gets interrupted or doesn't finish something that they start. Feeling no less angry, I come to the logical conclusion that I should start walking. There might be a town up ahead, someplace I could get fuel and come back for my bike. My character here is stranded in the desert but hasn't done anything about it yet, so I should start walking is perfectly fine here. Other times this might be applicable as something like it's starting to rain or just when you want to deliver information quickly to the reader without beating around the bush with descriptions. So here's the verdict. Cut it when literally nothing changes if it's gone and keep it 
when something actually starts or when an action is interrupted or unfinished. Weak word number six, just. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not guilty of this one at all. Just is one of those words that's really easy to overuse. <laughs> it's just so convenient, you know? But most of the time it's completely unnecessary. Here's an example of where I could cut this word from my own writing. I have no idea. Chances are I'm just overreacting. Wow, okay, how about I have no idea. Chances are I'm overreacting. Yeah, that's better. But now of course you're wondering, is there a right time and right place to use the word just? Yes, but it's a little tricky, so you have to play it by ear. Basically, you have to ask yourself, will it still make sense if I delete the word just? 99% of the time, the answer is gonna be yes. But sometimes there is still that 1%, you're gonna wanna use just as a limiter like this. Dad is working late at the hospital, so it's just me and mom like most nights. So take your time with cutting the word just. I know it seems totally unnecessary, like it always deserves to die, but not always. So give it a fair trial. Cut it when nothing changes in its absence. Keep it as a limiter or an indicator of time. Weak word number seven is somewhat or slightly. This is like the find a stronger word rule, except it's the other way around. So chances are if you're, if a character is doing something slightly or somewhat, you're using a word that is too strong for what you're trying to describe. Or it's just a nuance so unnecessary. <laughs> Why are you wasting our time with it? Here's an example of where I could cut this word from my own writing. Now plan B. Jerome looks slightly terrified. What's plan B? Strong word much? <laughs> yeah, what I'm trying to describe here is mild apprehension. Nothing like terror, by the way. So let's fix it using some active voice. Now, plan B. Jerome glances up at me, eyes wide. What's plan B? Oftentimes you can remove the word slightly and the sentence works just fine without it. Like, he leaned back slightly can just turn into he leaned back. We do not need to know if it's a slight gesture <laughs> or a full gesture. You can also use slightly and somewhat in sentences where there is no weaker word to describe what you mean. I feel somewhat responsible for this conflict. After all, I'm the one who brought up the topic that started the fight. Yes, what my character is feeling is responsibility because she's the one who brought up the topic that started the fight, but she didn't actually start the fight, so she's not entirely responsible. She's just somewhat responsible. So somewhat actually works there. Cut it if you can use a more accurate and intentional adjective instead. Keep it if it actually creates the most accurate description of what's happening. Weak word number eight, somehow. Can someone say missing information? <laughs> Using the word somehow is a mark of lazy writing. Even if you weren't being lazy exactly when you wrote it, it unfortunately comes across that way. The reader feels like they missed something and they kind of did because there's a missing link in your chain of information. Here's an example. Mary had her back to him, stirring cream into her coffee at the counter, but she somehow heard his footsteps on the stairs, even over the noise. So how exactly did she hear over the noise? Does she have some kind of super incredible hearing capabilities? <laughs> somehow isn't necessary here. We all know how people hear things. Let's just cut this word. Mary had her back to him, stirring cream into her coffee at the counter, but she heard his footsteps on the stairs, even over the noise. When is it okay to say somehow when a character is missing information? I'm a big supporter of writing in deep point of view, okay? Never leaving the protagonist's mind for a moment and seeing everything through their eyes. So if they don't know all the information for sure, then it's perfectly okay to use somehow. Like this. My bedroom door opens and I can somehow sense that it's grandma. My protagonist is blind, so she doesn't actually know who just opened her bedroom door, but she knows her grandmother so well that she can just sense when she's in the room. So that is a perfectly fine use of this word. Cut it when you're just being lazy by avoiding information <laughs> and keep it when your character is missing information or can't make sense of something. Weak word number nine, seem. Show, don't, tell. That's a good <laughs> rule to write by and chances are if you're saying that something seems a certain way, you're just weaseling your way out of the action. Yes, the point of view character is perceiving something, but how exactly are they perceiving it? Through action? Ha, huh, I thought so. Example, we can drop you off at the park and you can rejoin your class. 
She still seems apprehensive, but only replies, sounds like a plan. How does she seem apprehensive? What exactly is my protagonist noticing about her that screams apprehension? I don't know. The reader doesn't know, nobody knows. <laughs> so let's fix it. We can drop you off at the park and you can rejoin your class. She hesitates, rubbing the side of her neck. Uh, sure, sounds like a plan. Nothing a little nervous body language can't fix. <laughs> Sometimes, however, it is perfectly fine to use the word seem, especially when a character knows something intuitively, but they don't know how they know it. They just have a feeling about it. Example, although I shouldn't judge, I can't help but notice that her friendliness seems insincere. So here's the verdict on seem. Cut it when you can show us how the character perceives what's happening and keep it when your character's intuition is telling them something. Weak word number 10, definitely. This one <laughs> is pretty much always useless. It's like the narrator is just insisting what they believe is true, but in a totally dry way that just slows down reading time. Here's an example from my own writing. I'm in danger of crying happy tears again, and I definitely don't want to become an emotional basket case in this car. Look how useless it is. Look how you literally don't notice when it's gone. I'm in danger of crying happy tears again, and I don't want to become an emotional basket case in this car. When is it okay to use definitely when a character is previously unsure about something, but now they're convinced. Could I have the wrong theater? No way. I checked three times to make sure I was correct, and I've been to premieres before, so I'm familiar with how they go down. There is most definitely no premiere happening tonight. So earlier on in the scene, my protagonist wasn't sure if the premiere was happening, but now after the confirmation that it is not happening, it makes sense for him to say, definitely. There are other times when this word is 100% okay to use, so, Follow your gut. Cut it when it contributes literally nothing to the sentence and keep it when contrasted with previous doubt. So we just went over the 10 words, but this is kind of like a bonus, bonus word. That's not really a word. It's just more of like a type of word. Adverbs, AKA anything ending in L-Y. It's one of those more subtle ways that passive voice sneaks its way into your writing. Here's an example of how adverbs make prose super bland. Josephine smiles sympathetically. Of course we forgive you. Speak for yourself. Mom cuts her off bitterly, turning away from us both. Yes, you can see it, but it's not snappy and in your face. So, Let's change the adverbs to verbs and see what happens. Josephine gives me a sympathetic smile. Of course we forgive you. Speak for yourself, mom snaps, turning away from us both. So much better. Of course, adverbs aren't always bad and you're absolutely not going to want to delete all of them. It's impossible to avoid adverbs altogether, but you just wanna make sure that you don't have too much of one thing. To comb my manuscript for adverbs in my final round of copy edits, I use the app Hemingway. I talked about Hemingway Hemingway in my last editing video. It's an awesome free app that highlights adverbs, passive voice, hard to read sentences, and convoluted words. Super helpful. Okay, boom, that's it. Those are the top 10 weakest words that you should chop from your novel, but not always. So don't get too trigger happy with your delete key. I know it's fun to mercilessly chop words from your book, but you have to remember that some weak words actually work. It depends. So edit smart. Okay, now it's time for you to talk to me. Comment below and tell me which one of these weak words are you most guilty of using. Mine is definitely just. <laughs> I use just way too much. It just sounds nice, you know? <laughs> Smash that like button if you liked this video and be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already because I post writing videos and publishing videos and editing videos every single Wednesday and I would love to have you here in the community. Also, be sure to check out my Patreon because that's where we go beyond videos and take storytelling to the next level. The Patreon community is not only the best way to support what I'm doing here on YouTube, but it's also the only way to connect one-on-one -on -one with me and get better guidance on your story. So go to patreon.com slash Abby Emmons and check out all the awesome bonus content that I have over there for you. Until next week, my friend, happy word chopping and rock on. Mary had her back to him, stirring cream into her coffee at the counter, but she heard his footsteps on the stairs even over the noise. That's a scene with like a chainsaw going in, in the background because somebody's chopping up a tree outside, not the noise of her stirring cream into her coffee, which sounds, <laughs> never mind.